Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out the free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs at Real Life Pharmacology. A great study guide if you're in pharmacy school, med school, nursing school, going through pharmacology classes. Uh, I pull out a lot of info um, based upon my clinical experience as well as based upon my experience of passing uh, numerous board exams uh, throughout my career. So definitely go check that out. Just a simple email uh, will get you that 31-page uh, PDF for free. A great little uh, review resource for you there. So with that, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is clomiphene. Uh, brand name of this medication is Clomid, and this drug is categorized as a CIRM. So that's a selective estrogen receptor modifier. And you may have remembered, I believe I've covered a couple of CIRMs, but um, probably the most common CIRMs I think of in clinical practice are raloxifene and tamoxifen. Uh, however, clomiphene is definitely used for something uh, significantly different than those uh, two agents, tamoxifen being typically breast cancer, uh, raloxifene can be used for uh, osteoporosis. So clomiphene is actually used uh, to help stimulate ovulation. Okay, So we're primarily looking at female infertility and things of that nature. So mechanistically, how does it do that? Well, being a CIRM, you can expect that it's going to mess with uh, estrogen receptors in, in some capacity. Uh, so it binds estrogen receptors, and clomiphene actually hangs on to those receptors or stays coupled to those receptors uh, for a longer period of time than estrogen does. And if you remember uh, in the body, thinking about using birth control, that's using estrogen um, to essentially... Uh, reduce the risk of pregnancy by binding to those estrogen receptors longer. It kind of messes up that normal uh, estrogen negative feedback, uh, which ultimately uh, prevents uh, ovulation. So uh, clomiphene, from a, a mechanistic standpoint, increases uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and that is in the hypothalamus. And from there, the hypothalamus, it stimulates the pituitary to release FSH and LH. Now, remember, those are necessary uh, for growth and, and ultimately the release uh, of the ovar ovarian follicle. So with that, clomiphene basically interrupts or, or interferes uh, with that estrogen negative feedback that prevents that process and prevents ovulation, okay, if that makes sense. So um, with that said, it can definitely be used to uh, help uh, induce ovulation and help patients become pregnant that want to be. So hopefully I didn't uh, lose you along the way there. I mean, it's definitely a little bit of a, of a complex uh, physiological process, um, but ultimately uh, clomiphene uh, interferes with estrogen's negative feedback uh, on ovulation. So this drug is considered one of the first line medications for infertility. So you'll you'll definitely see it. Um, one of the reasons being it's oral, so that's a nice thing versus a lot of other infertility treatments are are injections. Uh, and what another thing it's got going for them is it's relatively. Uh, inexpensive compared to some of the other uh, infertility treatments. Now, dosing is a little unique. Um, it's actually 50 milligrams once a day. That's the traditional starting dose or typical dose. Uh, 50 milligrams once a day for five days. Um, and that, that may, re may, may be repeated within 30 days. Uh, we may try up to 100 milligrams if 50 milligrams isn't effective. And it is not recommend, due to adverse effects and other things, uh, not recommend to do more than six cycles of clomiphene. Now, adverse effect profile. When I think of, of CIRMs, I, I think that uh, menopausal type symptoms can happen. And if we think of that, 
if we're impacting estrogen or what it does in the body, um, certainly reducing estrogen effects can cause menopause type symptoms. So think vasomotor symptoms, uh, flushing, hot flashes, um, sometimes some stomach upset can happen with the medication as well. Uh, there can also be some other other changes like uh, impacts on lipids, so elevations in uh, triglycerides, for example, and, and potentially even rarely uh, increased risk for, for pancreatitis. Now, obviously, that's going to be a, a dose-dependent effect. So, you know, the larger the dose we use, the more often we use it. Um, that's probably a, an increasing risk type of thing uh, as we go there. Uh, increase in, in ovary size can happen. Um, rarely, there is what's called an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And that's considered uh, labeled as OHSS often. You'll see that. Uh, it's marked by significant GI pain, nausea and vomiting. Um, and that's kind of on the milder end. Uh, there have been rare cases of uh, severe instances of this. And it could impact uh, renal function, LFTs, electrolytes, and uh, cause a really severe uh, GI type pain. So... Um, not something that I have generally seen in, in practice, um, that ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but I think it is something to be aware of in patients who are uh, undergoing infertility treatments. And then, of course, I wanted to mention the risk of multiple births. So that is something that the patient obviously should be educated on, and this drug should be used by an experienced provider that knows what they're doing in infertility treatments for sure. Uh, one last little plug I wanted to mention. So, um, we did have a, I worked with a recent student and, and put together a pharmacist guide to infertility meds. So I certainly mentioned clomiphene in there. Uh, student did a really, really nice job on it. So, um, it's a good little summary. And I've got a table summarizing kind of the pluses and minuses of uh, all the different uh, infertility drugs, including clomiphene. So um, if you ser Google search MedEd 101, Pharmacist Guide to Infertility Meds, uh, you're, you're definitely going to find it, no problem. So uh, go check that out if you're, you're interested in kind of seeing that, that summarized table. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, like BCPS, ambulatory care, medication therapy management, geriatrics, or the NAPLEX exam, go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a growing list of resources. We update those resources on an annual basis so you know you're getting the best content uh, that can help prepare you for your exam. In addition, if you're a nurse, physician, dietitian, uh, we've got all sorts of resources for different groups. We've got a drug interactions book. We've got a food drug interactions book, a polypharmacy book, uh, all sorts of books on case studies, clinical pearls, um, great resources that can definitely be helpful to anyone uh, who manages polypharmacy patients and those that are taking medications. So uh, go check those out. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so let's talk drug interactions. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on drug interactions because fortunately with clomiphene, we don't have a lot. So that's definitely a, a nice thing. Really, the most important things I think about with drug interactions and clomiphene are going to be additive adverse effects. So knowing and understanding the adverse effect profile of clomiphene and other drugs, and that's going to give you, you know, the bulk of any potential additive effect type interaction. So uh, the two things I kind of think about are flushing and those type of, of symptoms. So drug like niacin could exacerbate that effect uh, potentially. That can definitely cause some flushing vasomotor type symptoms. Uh, and then uh, thinking about if we do use clomiphene to a significant extent at higher doses for longer periods of time, um, it could increase uh, triglycerides and lipids. So I think about some of the drugs that can exacerbate that and metabolic syndrome. So a uh, good example there being some of the antipsychotics, like a drug like olanzapine especially. So that really sums up the, the significant drug interactions that I think you're going to you know at least see a little bit in clinical practice. 
Um, again, not an all extensive list of drug interactions. Um, there are some rare, obscure things that, that do happen, but I try to provide uh, some of the most common things that you're going to see in clinical practice. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode today, leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. It helps us grow the podcast. Uh, share us with friends, colleagues, anyone who may be interested in learning pharmacology. Uh, the organic growth has been uh, tremendous, and I greatly appreciate uh, you listening uh, to this podcast and, of course, sharing it as well. If you want to track me down, uh, Eric Christensen, you can find me on LinkedIn. Also, you can find me at mededucation101 at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe at reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free 31-page PDF, great little study guide on the top 200 drugs. I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day.